We have some time now for a few questions, and we hope that you'll be able to uh, share. For And we would ask that you would go to the aisles here. We're going to try to get you mic'd up so that everyone can hear your questions. And we would ask that you not make speeches or, or try to pontificate too much, but and, and direct your question, if you will. We've got s these wonderful scholars here. To one of the uh, scholars that are here, uh, Dr. Wood or Dr. Ali, and uh, we will allow them to respond and then give some time for rebuttal from the from the other speaker as well. So if you want to line up here, um, we'll be glad to. On both sides, we'll try to take questions, alternate to the extent we have about 20 minutes for some questions. Over here, go ahead and get started if you would. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for this debate. It was wonderful to hear you both speak so eloquently on the topic. Um, Dr. Ali, in your interpretation of abrogation, the Torah and the Gospel were replaced by the Quran. The Quran teaches that the Gospel is God's Word. And earlier, you affirmed that God's Word cannot be changed. How then do you explain the differences found in the Bible and the Quran about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection? So as for the Quran saying that the, the gospel is the word of God, actually what the Quran says is so let the people of the gospel judge by that what God has revealed therein, uh, which means that within what Christians hold to be the gospel, there is an authentic gospel of Jesus, and that's what the Quran is directing Christians to, not necessarily all of the material. And as for the Quranic statement that uh, the word of God cannot be changed, what that means is that when God issues a decree, uh, he gives the commanding word for something to happen. Nobody else can, can issue a, a contrary decree and make that happen. God's word will prevail. Nobody can change what he uh, decrees. As for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, uh, the best way I feel of reading the Quranic passage uh, that most uh, speaks about this, uh, the fourth chapter of the Quran, the 157th verse, is to interpret the Christian uh, Gospels as, as making uh, it possible to think that uh, Jesus was taken down alive from the cross and he disappeared from the tomb. Now, there were some early Christians who believed this, according to Reginald Fuller in his book, The Formation of the Resurrection Narratives. And more recently, uh, a scholar uh, from Canada, uh, Daniel Smith, in his book, uh, The uh, Postmortem Vindication of Jesus and the Sayings Gospel Q, has actually traced historical material to show that this was a belief of some earlier Muslims, and this is why Mark ends as it does, with the women fleeing from the tomb, saying nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, the other Gospels pick up the story and have Jesus coming um, and meeting with his disciples. And the later the Gospel, the more he meets with them, more often and, and more clearly do they see him to be alive here in the flesh. He eats the broiled fish and honeycomb in, in Luke's Gospel. Uh, he's invite, he invites Thomas to touch his wound in, in John's Gospel. So the later the Gospel, the more sure you can be that Jesus certainly died on the cross, and he certainly reappeared to his disciples in the flesh. They saw him, they touched him, they examined him. But the earlier story seems to have been that he came down alive from the tomb and then from the cross, and then he disappeared from the tomb. Um, yeah, quick follow-up. Uh, I, th I think the, the, the original question was it was a great question. If the Quran is talking about abrogation uh, of earlier scriptures, why does the Quran later talk about the Torah and the Gospel as if they're clearly not abrogated? And this is a great point. Chapter 16, verse 101 is a Meccan surah. That's very early. Chapter 2, verse 106 is an early Medinan surah. But long after those passages were revealed, uh, Jews came to Muhammad for judgment, and the response of Allah was, why do they come to you? This is chapter 5, verse 43 of the Quran. The response of Allah was, why do they come to you for judgment when they have the Torah? So how is this, how is this uh, abrogating earlier scriptures when Allah tells Muhammad, they don't need you, they have the Torah? And so you find this over and over again, the Quran constantly affirming the inspiration, preservation, authority, and telling Jews and Christians you have to judge by these scriptures, which makes no sense if the scriptures were abrogated. So we have to go with the traditional Orthodox Muslim interpretation. Um, I wanted to see if you could reconcile. Who's the question for? Uh, it's for both, actually. I wanted to see, Dr. Uh, Ali, if you could reconcile words versus actions. We sit here in a very comfortable auditorium while the Middle East, Minor Asia, uh, North Africa is ablaze. Peace does not, does not characterize that area. If you look at the 1,400-year history of Islam, 
270 million Christians, Hindus, North Africans, and so forth have been slaughtered. How do you reconcile uh, this book of peace when the predominant uh, ideology in this area is Islam? <laughs> yes, uh, and of course, it will be a challenge to answer it, but let me try. Uh, the, uh, yes, it's important that we look at the actions uh, that, that are taking place on the ground and ask, like, who really stands for peace? Now, if we look at actions, let's look at more broad actions. Let's look at Muslims suffering also in Burma and in the Central African Republic. Let's look at the Palestinian problem, which actually, as I will demonstrate tomorrow, actually goes back to statements in the Bible saying that the land belongs to a certain uh, group of people. And, and that's leading to what we know today as the Palestinian problem. It sparks more violence. Let's look back at the history of Christianity. Helen Ellerby has written a book, which I don't totally identify with, uh, but uh, the book is entitled The Dark History of Christianity. I think it's interesting to read it and see that side of what is being claimed, though all of that I, I don't necessarily think to be true. I don't find it to be a scholarly work, but I think that some of the uh, matters that she has raised are important for us to bear in mind. Uh, more uh, scholarly is uh, Riley Smith in his book, The History of the Crusades, where he uh, describes as the first Holocaust, the first Holocaust was when the Crusaders went down and, and, and were decimating Jews and forcing the rest into baptism uh, and conversion by, by force. Uh, let, let's look at the history of violence spurned by uh, Christian uh, scriptures. Uh, let's look at the witch hunts uh, in Salem. Uh, let's look at the history of inquisitions and the wars of religion in Europe. So we have to look at the whole big picture and then take religion aside and, and look at our modern secular context in which uh, we religious people don't have to fight our battles because we have the secular people who fight the battles for us. So we are protected in great countries like the United States of America because there's a military that goes out and fights and, that, and, fights, and they commit the atrocities cities uh, somewhere else. So think about the bombing of uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, this was from a, a majority Christian nation. So let's put all of this sum together and then look at the actions together. A hand of voice coming tomorrow night, I suspect. Go ahead. Check, check, check. Yeah, I didn't detect an answer to the actual uh, question there. I think he was making a general point about, you know, violence can be committed for all kinds of reasons, so it could also be committed by Muslims, and so maybe we shouldn't point a finger because, you know, everyone's got blood on their hands, something like that. Um, but I, I think the question was that was a very important one, right? Um, you know, people are being killed and, and slaughtered as we're sitting here uh, in the comfort of this auditorium. And we're debating whether Islam is, I mean, whether the Quran is a book of peace when, I mean, what, why are, why is Shabir trying to convince us, in other words? Why, I mean, why not try and convince uh, ISIS or the Taliban or some of these groups? And the, and the reason is he couldn't. He'd get killed over there. And so the only way we're even to, able to have this discussion is because we're in a context that allows that kind of freedom. And that's a, a serious problem because assuming Shabir is right, Assuming he was right, he could never bring that message into the Muslim world. Uh, and so, according to Shabir, it would seem that it's a lost cause. Question over here. Uh, thank you. Uh, for both of you, I'd like to ask this question. In uh, uh, the history of Islam, in the history uh, from the beginning, and at the history at the end, in the history of Islam at the beginning, was that the time when uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon him. He told his people to go to a country called Ethiopia. Now do any of you know the religion of those people? He told his people to keep the peace and to keep the conflict from, this is what we're talking about, and not have uh, chaos and confusion. He told his people to go. Some of his beloved, some of the people he loved the most, he told them to go, not fight, but go to Ethiopia. Now, do any of you know what Ethiopia was? And then, once he got there, the Ethiopian king was told that those people were causing conflict and were not good people, and that he should, uh, they should be taken back. But then, All right, let's, let's the king, wait a minute, then the king asked him why, and he wanted to hear what they had to say. Okay, now, 
the end, Question, please. he went, okay, at the end, Prophet Muhammad told when his army entered Mecca, did he go in peacefully or did he slaughter? So um, what, what the brother is driving at is that uh, there, there is a narrative saying that in the early days when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his followers were being persecuted in, in Mecca, and this lasted for 13 long years, uh, the Prophet began to direct his followers to migrate away from that scene of violence for their own protection and to seek shelter in a nearby Christian land under a Christian king, Najashi or Negus, uh, who was known for his justice. And uh, when the Muslims went there, uh, the people who were persecuting them from Mecca went there to reclaim them and uh, made up stories about what they believe and tried to persuade the king, telling the king that these Muslims do not believe in Jesus. But the story goes uh, that the king uh, uh, talked to the Muslims themselves. They recited passages from the Quran, which proved their belief in Jesus, and the, and the king uh, allowed them to stay in his land under protection. So I think what that story proves, if it is authentic, is that, uh, it, uh, it, that Muslims can live under a non-Muslim rule. And many take that to be a justification for Muslims living in many parts of the West like I am here today. And yes, we enjoy many freedoms and protections, and we thank God for those freedoms and protections. And yes, it is true that some of the things I've said here tonight would not be welcome in some circles. When we're not talking about what is welcome and what you know, people will be happy to hear, we're, we're asking about what is true historically and how do we uh, sift between what is true and what is false. We don't take everything wholesale as though everything is true, but we do not reject everything as though it is false as well. We go judiciously, as some of the scholars I've cited, like Harold Motsky and uh, William Montgomery Watt, uh, not like the Robert Spencer and, and, and others who are just simply out to uh, demolish anything that Muslims hold uh, dear. Uh, now, the, when the, finally the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, marched into Mecca, according to Islamic uh, sources, uh, he forgave the very enemies who were persecuting the Muslims from the beginning. And that shows the just war strategy. This is how you end the war, by forgiving and repatriating. Well, I, I agree with quite a bit of what Shabir said about, um, you know, that Muhammad sending his followers into Ethiopia and so on, but that doesn't contradict anything I've said. I've said that when Muslims are in the minority, when Muslims are in the minority, they are to promote a message of peace and tolerance, and so Muhammad was protecting the Muslim community. I, I, I believe that happened. Uh, the question is what happens when they're not in the minority anymore, and then the revelations change. Now, Shabir points out that M Muhammad's entry into uh, Mecca was peaceful. They surrendered. And so, yes, Muhammad could have just slaughtered everyone. But you see that Muhammad's goal from the beginning was, to, was for the people of Mecca to agree with him. And it wasn't very long after the conquest of Mecca that uh, Muhammad received chapter 9, verse 5 of the Quran, uh, which commands, uh, commands him to slay the idolaters wherever you find them. And so now they, they were given a period where they could leave if they wanted to. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, this wasn't some sort of interfaith community. You had to be Muslim uh, or you had to leave uh, and, or you would be killed. And that's what we see to this very day uh, in Mecca. Couldn't have this conversation in Mecca. Um, my question is to Mr. Wood. Uh, your whole premise is that uh, the later verses abrogate the earlier verses where specifically you mentioned that the verses of violence abrogate the verses of peace which you were revealed earlier. So I want your, uh, to, uh, you to explain uh, or reconcile that the last verses um, which I have, uh, which were revealed, and which is the chapter 5, and how do we know that is, those are the last verses? Because the revelation itself says that this day I have completed your religion and I have perfected my commands. And uh, the verse says, is, O oh, you who believe, be upright for Allah, bearer of the witness with justice. So it says that be the bearer of the witness with justice and let not hatred of a people incite you not to act equitably. Act equitably. This is nearer to piety and uh, surely Allah is aware of what you do. Now, to my understanding, if there is justice and call for justice, that is the basis of peace. So this, uh, to me, is the final order which abrogate. If there is anything you think that there was an order for violence, uh, what do you say about that? 
Well, you're quoting, you're quoting Surah 5, and some have interpreted, uh, well, that verse, that verse in particular, you can interpret to be the last, and you'd have some, you'd have some authority there. Uh, but however you are interpreting these verses, chapter 9 is the final, that's the last major Surah revealed. And so these are where you get the commands. And if you're trying to reconcile them, you can't say something about uh, Allah completing your religion or something like that and saying, well, therefore he doesn't mean what he says when he says fight those who do not believe. Um, if, 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 these are the, if these are the final marching orders, if you're saying he doesn't mean that, right? If you're saying any, any other thing you could say that he meant, there are words for that. There are words for that in the Quran. I mean, there, there are words from that that Allah could have, could have said those things. And so when, I mean, th think about what I'm doing here. I say, okay, here's a book. Here's a book. I open the book, and there are various passages. Some are peaceful, some are violent, some are somewhere in between. Uh, how am I supposed to interpret this? Well, I, I go to the Sirah. It tells me how to interpret it. I go to the Tafsir, the Muslim commentaries. It tells me how to interpret it. I go to the Hadith. It tells me how to interpret these, these passages. And wherever I go, I find early on when Muhammad is a minority, Peace and tolerance. Later, when he could fight, it's fight, but only defensively. Finally, it's fight those who do not believe in Allah. And then, is that really what he means? Is that how Muhammad interprets it? What's Muhammad say? I've been commanded to fight people in, until they say there's no God but Allah. And so, I, I think I'm, I'm being as accurate and careful as I know Shabir thinks. I'm just trying to win points or something here. But I, I'm going, I mean, almost every Islamic commentator of all time is on my side here. So, if, if I'm wrong then your problem should be with Allah and him laying down these passages and never getting someone who can interpret it accurately until we get to the modern Western period where Muslims know what he really meant. Now, it, it, you see, I, th I think David is not getting the point. How do, he's asking, how do we know what the passage means? We go to the Muslim commentators, we go to the Muslim hadith, we go to the Muslim and so on. He doesn't realize that he's looking at materials which were written hundreds of years after the Quran by Muslims who formulated a particular way of doing things. And yes, that is a formulation. Some Muslims thought about it in that way. When Muhammad wa was weak, he was peaceful. Uh, when he, he reached some strength, he started to fight defensive wars. When he reached a final position of, of power, he started to think of dominating the enemy, and that's how the Quran is representing his thought. So, so David is in line with some classical commentary on the Quran. And ISIS and all of these violent groups, they're picking up on the similar type of commentary, and they're twisting it even further, doing things that our classical scholars would not have uh, allowed for, and representatives of the tra classical tradition to this day would not allow for. But I'm saying to David, let's go back with historical minds and find out what was the Quran actually saying before the books of hadith and history among Muslims were written. And the brother has a good point. Probably Surah 5 was the last uh, chapter of the, of the Quran because it has a verse which seems to be a summation. This day we have completed your religion for you. We have time for just two more questions, if we could get one from each side. Then. Right here. Uh, Dr. Ali, my question is about uh, your view of abrogation uh, you put forward in the debate. Uh, basically, you cited Jesus as a precedent when talking about the Jewish convert to Islam. Uh, they were telling him not to keep the kosher laws anymore, not not uh, keep Sabbath, to submit completely to uh, following those laws. And also, you said uh, you cited Jesus as a precedent, you know, about your view of the uh, Quran abrogating previous revelations, so the Torah and the uh, Gospels. So my question is, do you think your view could stand if Jesus didn't abrogate Torah and he was fully t Torah observant? Because it seems like in the modern New Testament, uh, New Testament scholarship, that's where the consensus is moving, or it's already there, that he was uh, fully Torah observant. So basically, did Jesus eat pork? Thank you. Uh, actually, the way the Mr. Quran puts this is that the, Jesus came to preach to his people, saying to them, that I should make permissible for you some of that which was previously made impermissible for you. But whether that was in the actual laws of the Torah or in the oral tradition, this is not stated in the Quran. And it is possible that Jesus was a, a Torah observant Jew, and, uh, and, and that's what history represents him to be, and how much of that he challenged. <coughs> Uh, it's not so very clear from a historical point of view, but generally history comes in uh, with the view that Jesus was a Jew. He lived in, and preached in the Jewish milieu, and he and his early followers were following the Torah, uh, even right down to the kosher laws. And now the question arose as to what is to be done with the Gentiles. Uh, should we impose on them the same laws? And only four food laws were 
imposed on the Gentiles, including you cannot eat the meat of strangled animals or meat that is sacrificed to idols uh, or the dead animals. And uh, this was uh, in a, ruled in a church council in, in Jerusalem under the headship of uh, James, the brother of the Lord, in chapter 15 of Acts. Uh, and then that message was given to Paul to go and preach to everyone, uh, which means that the early church were still Torah observant, at least in, in Palestine. And now we want to know how did this message get changed from, uh, from Judaism to Christianity? How did Christianity become a non-Torah observant uh, religion? Uh, some passages are cited in the, in the Gospels to show that Jesus himself uh, abrogated the food, food laws. For example, Mark chapter 7. But when we go to Matthew's rendition of that, uh, we see that Matthew is leaning in on the side of following the Torah. And in the same episode, Matthew is not giving the impression that Jesus abrogated the food laws. The book of Revelation shows that when Jesus comes back, he's going to blame all of those churches who ate the meat of, that are sacrificed to idols, which means that Jesus wants his church to continue observing the food laws. Well, it's kind of odd, since even the Quran says that Jesus came to change some of the, some of the laws um, of, of the Torah. Uh, but as far as Islam claiming that the Quran abrogates prior scriptures, I wouldn't have any objection to Islam teaching that if that's what the Quran actually said. But that's not what the Quran says. The, the impression you get from the Quran is Jews had a revelation that was given to them. Christians had a revelation to them that was given to them. Other people from other languages and backgrounds, they had revelations that were given to them, but there was no revelation in Arabic. And so that there would be a revelation in Arabic, Allah sent Muhammad to reveal the Quran. That's the impression you get. So that's why in chapter 5, verses 43 to 48, Allah says that the Jews have to judge by the Torah and the Christians have to judge by the gospel. And in verse 48, that Muslims have to judge by the Quran. So each group has its own revelation. So no, this has nothing to do. There's no way to work uh, an abrogation of previous scriptures in here. The previous scriptures apply to their groups. And so abrogation must be Quran abrogating other verses of the Quran. Final question here. Yes. I have, I'm here because I'm so ignorant of, of the Quran, please. So forgive my ignorance, but I came to learn, and I've heard, and uh, not very many authoritative sources, that the Quran is given, it's absolute, it cannot be changed, cannot be reinterpreted, it is. That's what I've heard. Tonight I've heard nothing from you except that there's continual, continual changing and in interpretation, and I'm having difficulty with understanding just where the Quran is now in that absolute state. Okay, so... Um, you are right. According to Muslim belief, the Quran cannot be changed. But then we're talking about the text of the Quran. Now, understanding the Quran is another matter. David has gone to great lengths to show that the Quran is very clear. But he didn't cite Surah 3, verse number 7, which says that the Quran has clear verses and also verses which are not clear. And it's the people who have disease in their hearts who go after the unclear verses and then make it mean what they want it to, want it to, to mean. So there can be interpretations over time. Uh, the Quran is very clear about certain central doctrines. Like, for example, there is only one God, that uh, Muhammad is a messenger of God, that Jesus, Moses, uh, Abraham are all messengers of God. They're humans, they're servants. There is only one God, and everyone apart from that one God are his servants and creatures. Uh, so the Quran is very clear about that. And then other things the Quran may be fuzzy about, and that's fine. God has left it that way. Instead of giving us a book that straight jackets us, he gives us a book that can speak to different minds at different times. It can mean different things to different people. Sometimes we say something, and we know that it will be interpreted two ways, and we say that's fine. Some people understand it this way, and that's fine with me. Some people understand it the other way, that's fine with me as well. But if we know that there's going to be a serious misunderstanding, we'll stop and clarify ourselves and explain further what we mean. But the Quran has actually left itself such that it is open to interpretation. And when we go to the classical interpreta interpreters of the Quran, we see that there is usually a variety. Uh, for example, uh, David is saying that nobody interpreted that verse, uh, Surah 2, verse 100, 208, to say that uh, Salm or Silm uh, could mean peace. And in fact, uh, what he did mention is that Al-Qurtubi in his tafsir, in his commentary a classical scholar, uh, said that uh, literally it means that, it means peace. But he's saying we can't uh, accept that it means peace here because nowhere else in the Quran God is telling us in such a categorical way to enter into peace. So it couldn't mean that, that this, in this passage as well. Here his method is wrong. He's a great scholar, but he's discounting the passage, that, discounting that literal meaning because he's saying we can't accept it because nowhere else does it say that. So how many times does it have to say 
in the Quran, enter into peace completely for you to accept that that is the truth. So there are interpretations and there are mistaken interpretations. Uh, we, as uh, faithful followers of the book today, can actually revisit some of these interpretations, and that's what we're doing. Actually, what al qurtubi says is there's a textual variant in the manuscript tradition and that uh, if it's read as salm, it would mean truce, which wouldn't make any sense, and that if you read it as silm, it means Islam. And then he gives the historical background, the same historical background that I gave uh, when I presented it. Um, now, Shabir went to Surah 3, verse 7, to show that, uh, that there are passages of the Quran which only Allah understands. So not everything in the Quran is completely clear. That's true. But what, if, you, if you look at what that means, you have to reconcile that with all of the Quran verses that say over and over and over again, many of which I put in there. There are many more, many of which I put up on the screen, saying that the Quran is clear. And the way Muslim scholars reconciled those is, yes, there can be theological statements about, uh, uh, about Allah or something that only Allah understands. But when he gives you a command on what to do, that's perfectly clear. And guess what? That's the only thing I use the perfect uh, clarity of the Quran to mean, is that the verses I quoted mean exactly what they say. They are commands. Thank you, David. Thank you, Shabir. Please join me in thanking them very much for the their presentation. Remind you that tomorrow night at the same time, right here, 6.30, same place, we'll have a discussion, is the Bible a book of peace? So I do invite you to be here tomorrow night at 6.30. As well, another way to show your appreciation for our great speakers, there's a donation box, remember, out of the lobby. Please, uh, if you can, make a contribution to that, help them out, and uh, we'll see you here tomorrow night. Uh, please uh, take your trash with you. We don't want to make it hard on the university. Anybody brought anything, take it out so they won't have a hard time cleaning it up tomorrow, please. Thank you. Thank you.